Good afternoon, Wakefield, and welcome to this special school committee meeting on this Friday, September 25th, 2020. I'd like to note that this is a virtual meeting via Zoom and broadcast on WCATS Live Facebook page. I'd like to start the meeting off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which we stand, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next is a reading of our mission statement. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident lifelong learners, who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and, and challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. Um, next on the agenda, um, just a quick um, comment. Um, the purpose of this school committee meeting, uh, special school committee meeting, is for Superintendent Lyons and also um, Bala Engineering, that's B-A-L-A, -A, for Bala Engineering um, to provide information and updates about the transition to the phase three reopening plan and also the, uh, to provide information about building safety. Uh, we did not have um, this uh, most recent Bala report um, at Tuesday night school committee meeting. So we thought it would be important for them um, to invite them to our meeting this afternoon. Um, and so with that, I have not, nothing further uh, if I can pass it on to Superintendent Lyons. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on a Friday afternoon. I know it's not easy, um, but we appreciate the time and I appreciate the school committee's guidance on, on convening this meeting. Um, and Amy's point, I think, is an important one. You know, we did not have um, information. Um, for example, our COVID community level data was not updated. That gets updated on Wednesday evening. Um, so for us to, to kind of make any decisions on Tuesday, uh, we think would have been premature. So as, as we have shared in our reopening plan, we are scheduled to go from phase two, which is remote for the majority of our students, um, while we're having some students come back in small groups, the, the, the plan um, suggests that we should change to our hybrid plan, which invites more students back into our buildings on Tuesday, the 29th, right? And so we would pick up our schedule on Tuesday, the 29th with a hybrid day. We would have Wednesday would be a remote day and then Thursday, Friday would also be a hybrid day. One of the things that we said that we would share and we would look at, um, we would look at it um, collectively as an as administrative group. We would look at it with the WEA and we would also look at it um, kind of day to day is um, again, our community level data. Currently, um, the, the percent positivity rate for Wakefield is at 0.8%. So it's under 1% which in kind of in terms of the rating uh, maintains our community in at the green level, which the guidance that we've gotten from the commissioner of education and from the governor is pretty clear that if your community is, is in, in this level um, and public health data will allow that we should be working toward um, having students back in school and, and reopening. And I, and I think that our public health data indicates that we should be moving in that direction. So that's just a, that's just a very quick snapshot about data and, and kind of the where that information comes from. That's on the COVID-19 community level data map, which you can, um, you can find on the DPH website, or you can simply Google COVID-19 community level data map and input whatever community that you might be interested in and put Wake, Wakefield, and it will give you the information that I'm referring to as well as the color coding. So the other piece that we've said that we would look at is, is other data and we said that we would also consult with our Board of Health. So I've consulted with our director of our Wakefield Board of Health, Ruth Clay. We've discussed our reopening plan. We've discussed the current health, public health data. Um, she has indicated that she is in, um, she supports um, us transitioning from phase two to phase three on Tuesday. So one of the things that we had discussed in addition to public health data 
on Tuesday evening at the school committee was our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning information that was forthcoming from our third party vendor, which is Bala Engineering. And so they have just sent over um, our, an executive summary or executive summaries of kind of the state of our schools. And so, I, and I don't want to speak for Ed Dolan and, and Peter Sosniak that are, that are here with us today from Bala. I'll introduce them in a moment, but I know that they were working um, kind of double time to get us this information, right? So our work with them will continue after this meeting um, in that we will be going through um, the executive summaries that they have provided and they will be working with our director of facilities, Bob Shiroli, and also our director of DPW, Joe Conway, um, to make any remedies that need to be made um, to ensure that our, our buildings and the airflow in our buildings are as, uh, as safe and as, as operating as well as they possibly can be. And so before I turn it over to Ed and Peter, I would like to invite Bob Shiroli to make any remarks that he needs to provide for facilities. I'm, I'm looking at a split screen, so I, I know I have uh, people on three screens. So Bob, are you on this call? I don't believe he is, sir. Okay. Yeah, he is. He is. I'll, I'll check in with him. I'll All check right. In. I know he, he had a family commitment today and he's zooming in from another location. So um, so maybe it's a good time to, to turn it over to Ed and to Peter to talk a little bit about the, the work that they're doing um, with the Wakefield Public Schools. They did kind of two phases of uh, work, right? So phase one was an assessment of our mechanical systems. And phase two, was kind of a measurement of, of air quality. What we were able to learn um, just on a phone call with them earlier today was that um, they were able to measure a number of our, of our systems, um, but they're still, um, are inter they are interested in following up to collect some additional data. But based on the information that they have provided, they have been able to give us um, some suggested mitigation strategies for COVID for us to reopen. And so I'd like to introduce Ed Dolan and Peter Selsniak. Ed? Great, thank you, Doug. And thanks everyone for having us. Um, so yeah, as Doug, as Doug had alluded to, the first step um, in what we performed was to go in and do just a visual obs observation of what the systems were that serve each school and just describe those systems as well as, you know, it gives us an understanding of what could be done from a mitigation strategy standpoint. Um, the second phase, which we are in the process of right now and have completed an initial report, um, is to do airflow measurements, just to see that the uh, systems are operating properly and the amount of air, both uh, return air and, <clears throat> excuse me, and outside air, just to see the quantities that are being provided to each of the spaces. Um, and from that data, we've been able to come up with um, some suggestions, both short and long-term. Uh, so with that, um, Doug, do you think it's best we just go kind of school by school and I can give a description or do you want me to do an overview? I think that'd be great. Okay, great, all right. Um, uh, Peter and I kind of had split up evaluation of these. So Peter, I, if it's okay with you, I'll go first and just, well, I'll start with uh, Woodville Elementary. Okay, great. Um, so for Woodville Ele Elementary School, um, the, the systems that uh, are in that school uh, consist of pr predominantly for the classrooms, uh, unit ventilators. And what those are, are the unit ventilators are within the space, they're usually those console units that you see, and they have return air that goes through them and they have outside air. Um, usually they have a grill on the outside, they're on perimeter spaces and the grill's on, on the outside. So they mix return air and outside air, filter it and heat it, typically heat it, um, sometimes heat it and cool it as well to condition it for the space. So the, the, classroom, the majority of the classrooms have those unit ventilators. Um, the cafeteria, the larger spaces such as the cafeteria, the gymnasium, and a few other miscellaneous spaces 
are served by air handling units that have uh, that have the ability to heat and cool and filter the air. And then the administrative music and library spaces are served by a rooftop unit, which is also has the ability to bring in outside air, uh, return air and filter it and heat it and cool it. So that, that's a quick summary of, of the, the systems in the space. Based on the measurements, um, I'll start with the classrooms. The, the classrooms were pr uh, providing approximately about 700 to 1,000 CFM, which is an airflow measurement, cubic feet per minute of uh, air to the space. And about two to 400 of it were outdoor air, you know, to, depending on, you know, the, each specific measurement that was taken. And this supported a room of about 1,000 square feet. So what that means is the, that that's a we'll we'll put it in terms of an air change rate, which is really how many times the air turns over within an hour, and that equates to about one and a half to two air changes per hour. Now, when you know pre-pandemic, um, that's you know what what the code requirements were for ventilation for classroom spaces. You know, you brought in enough outdoor air that was suitable based on the code at the whatever the applicable code at the time was, you know, the, the version of the mechanical code. And it was based on the occupancy of the space. So that is that one and a half to two, usually one and a half to two and a half is what we see based on the, the generation of the school um, is what the code required for ventilation. So that's pretty, it's typical. Now, as we, as we, the, the air handling units also, those measurements were right in the same range as well. Now, what I'm going to do now is refer to a document that um, that we had seen and have been using um, for th that was produced by the Harvard School of Public Health, and that was produced in late August. And it was um, uh, it's you know it, it, they put out a lot of information regarding uh, returning to schools, reopening of schools, and what amounts of air that you would typically want to see to deal with um, contaminants within the space, and. Harvard School of Public Health noted that the air, uh, good air change rate in a space based on what we're going through right now would be between four and five air changes an hour. And if you had six or above, that would be ideal. So this, as you can see, is at least double of what you would typically provide based on the code requirements that still exist today and at the time. Um, so what, what that means, why they came up with those numbers is because that is based on the amount of air that you can deliver into a space, you know, clean, fresh air, um, that you can deliver into a space to properly dilute contaminants within the space from whatever level they are down to roughly about 1% of their level within an hour. So that, that just puts it in perspective of why those numbers were thrown out there. Um, so now, based on that, you know, we have systems that are in the range of one and a half to two and a half. How can we, how can we move forward and supplement it right now? So easiest way in the short term is to open the windows. You know, it, it, based on a uh, number of windows typically seen in a classroom um, and the average wind speed in the, the town of Wakefield, if you uh, open the windows, um, you know, just based on very, very conservative numbers, you would have air infiltrating the space that was, would provide well in addition of five air changes per hour. Uh, however, we do understand that It'll be cold soon, and that's not something that's a long-term can be a long-term strategy. So, um, in the addition to in, in addition to um, the outside air that's provided by the unit ventilators, you know, we would recommend putting air purifiers in the space, which I know Doug has moved forward with already for a number of, of the schools, and that can provide the additional air change rates that are required to help improve the indoor air quality within those spaces. Um, you know, once once th that's really the the short term solutions. Uh, the 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 other thing I would note is if we did see any spaces that didn't have outside air to them at all, or the ability to get outside air to them at all by windows or anything, um, you know, even if putting in air purifiers, if you couldn't supplement it at all with you know outside air for, with any quantity, we would recommend that those units not uh, those rooms not be utilized until whatever system served them was fixed and you could get a proportion of outside air. We did not see any spaces in, um, in the school, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Woodville that, that met that criteria. 
So the, the recommendations going forward really for the school are, you know, one, we'll work with facility staff and, you know, Peter's on the, um, on the commissioning side and the airflow measurement side has come up with action items um, for units that looked like they needed to have outside air dampers checked, fans checked, things of that nature to make sure those systems are operating to design and then supplementing it with the methods that I had said previous, just said previously. So that's just the Woodville School. Uh, before I go on to the next school, I know I just threw out a lot of information. I'm sure you may have questions. May, do we wanna, do we wanna tackle any of those now? Because a lot of, a lot of the school systems, as we go through, Peter and I go through this, you'll notice a lot of the schools have similar systems. Um, so a lot of these uh, observations and recommendations are gonna be similar. So based on that, I just figured maybe we could tackle some questions right now if you have them. Right. And I had a question, mm -hmm. this is Mike Boudreau. So one question that as you go through these schools, understanding where we are relative to other communities would be helpful to know. And right. obviously we have some older schools, some newer schools, but any sort of relevance you can give us to other communities would be helpful. Sure, absolutely. I will tell you that Peter, Peter's team, um, in addition to, um, you know, we, we have a number of people working on this and have come up because of the demand uh, from both not only our local Boston office, but down in New York and Philadelphia have been helping us. And between all the teams, we're, we're working with roughly about 10 school districts and we've um, done observations and measurements of over 60 schools. And I will say, these, a lot of the observations are the same. A lot of the systems are the same, unless you get into really, really old schools you're, you know, 100 years old, which usually have, don't have unit ventilators and just have, you know, fans bringing in fresh air and heat, or you have, you know, there are some schools that are very new and have new, you know, non systems that aren't unit ventilators and more like air conditioning equipment that distribute to, to the spaces. Um, but those are few and far between. The majority of the schools fit in that middle level that have unit ventilators and then either some ceiling mounted air handling units or rooftop units to feed large spaces like gymnasiums or things of that nature. And they're, they're all pretty much in the same range, Mike. So, um, so the, the, what, we, what we saw is very comparable. Appreciate it, thank you. Sure, no problem. Yes. Okay, uh, if there aren't any other questions, I will switch to, what's the next one? I'm sorry, I have a lot of reports up. Next one up is uh, Dolbert. But let, okay, sure. I'm sorry, did somebody have a question? No, I was just, uh, it's Peter, I, I was just making sure. Uh, I just wanted to say, like you were saying, the, a lot of these schools are the same, and the recommendations that, you know, that Ed and myself are going to go through are uh, repetitious. A, you know, good 80% of what we're looking at is, uh, I would say unit ventilators in the classrooms, you know, so. so can, can you guys hear me? This is Bob. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Hi, Bob. I'm, yes. I, I've been having trouble getting on. I tried, I tried dialing in, but I'm, I'm kind of on the Zoom right now. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch base on was on, on Greenwood. I don't know if you guys talked about that. I've been trying to follow along, but it's uh, been shoddy service where I am. Um, one thing I want to say is uh, the DPW is working on getting um, – double way fans to to bring fresh air in and extract old air and we have air purifiers that we had dropped off yesterday as well that should be um set up in all the classrooms as well this week i don't know if that was um that was mentioned or not but i just uh, wanted to say that yeah we haven't we haven't well, we've only spoke That's we've only spoken about woodville so far bob all right i'm sorry i've been trying no to get on and off and trying to speak when doug asked me to speak but it wasn't going through so uh sorry i've, I've again i have shoddy service so I'm trying to just to uh mention and, and say kind of something but sorry about that i'll uh, i'll meet myself no, thanks no, mike no worries at all uh okay so i'll i'll move on to dolbear quick um Dolbert has uh, very very similar systems um most of the classrooms are unit ventilators uh the the uh, cafeteria, administrative offices, library, and teacher's room, um, and gymnasium are served by rooftop units. Uh, one rooftop unit serves uh, the gymnasium, and the other rooftop unit serves the other spaces I mentioned, uh, cafeteria, admin, uh, library, and teacher's room. Those units provide both heating and cooling and a mixture of return air and outside air, uh, which is filtered. 
the now for this school, um, concentrating on the unit ventilators, uh, we the supply air we measured was between 900 and 1,000 CFM of supply air. However, the outside air was only between 100 and 200 CFM. And so that put air change rates lower in the realm of uh, 0.5 to 1 air changes per hour, which is, you know, uh, slightly below what we would expect for, for those types of systems in those rooms. However, we did observe that a lot of those units um, seemed to have some either sticking dampers or issues with the, with the outside air dampers not being open fully. So the, those are action items that we will have that we can work with Bob's group um, to correct. You know, we would, expect, we would expect those outside air quantities to be in the same uh, realm as what I noted for Woodville. And uh, because they were to address those items. Um, the calculations for the rooftop units, there are some of the spaces that were larger that the, because of the height of those spaces, they're up, you know, 15, 20 feet above the ground. So we couldn't get up there to make um, uh, airflow measurements. However, the, the units did appear to be in good working order. So, and are those short term mitigation events or will that take a while to do that? Uh, no, they're pretty short term. Uh, Peter, you might want to jump in on this. Uh, a lot yeah. of a lot of those dampers, it didn't seem like there would need to be replacements. It was more just uh, yeah. So 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 it's just you know there's a there's a lot of like these unit ventilators. There's there's tons of them, you know. So then they are mechanical systems, and um, you know after a couple couple of years, they the dampers sometimes hang up, get a little loose, and might need tightening of a screw and and maybe. A, Maybe maybe a spray of uh, some WD-40 on the dampers. So um, so those are so if a damper hang hangs up, we got to get it uh, moving again. And these are usually quick repairs unless there's a burned out damper or a motor damper. Then you know you can uh, you, even that it's 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 not not nothing crazy. You know you just uh, you you have a bunch on on spare. I'm sure you know. Um, uh, the school, I'm sure, is doing maintenance on on these, so they can uh, re replace as as necessary. And and if there was a uh, an issue with the actuator itself, which could be you know take a couple of days to get, we could only always uh, make those uh, dampers manual for the short term, and then you know sure. before the school day starts, facilities can open them and make sure that they're getting all the outside air, so they can be right. quickly. In, in a different school district, we actually had, uh, you know, facilities go through a bunch of items that we identified, and and you know they were very, uh, very quick about it. You know, it took it took a very short period of time, a day or so, to to go through a, you know, pretty pretty significant list of uh, of items that we had on there and and remedy a lot of them. Okay, great, thank you, Peter. Um, so because the systems are practically the same as what I said for Woodville. Uh, a lot of the, the recommendations are the same as well. Uh, we can supplement the amount of air. Well, the first one is to go through and, and make sure that those unit ventilators are, are operating and uh, can achieve the higher amount of outside air. And then supplement them with windows in the short term and opening windows and also air purifiers when it gets too cold. Um, you know, well, what we're trying to do with these recommendations is understand that you know, they have to be um, uh, solutions that can be implemented fairly quickly and still provide a good amount of, uh, a good level of air quality. So that, that's why we're, we're focusing on things like this. Obviously, you know, there can always be very long-term solutions where you can get into um, putting in technologies like bipolar ionization to help improve in indoor air quality or supplementing ventilation, but those are like long-term construction projects. And we note them in the, um, the first round of assessments of the spaces, but what we're talking about now is really things that you can do uh, and, you know, things that are readily available so that uh, the indoor air quality can be improved and um, people can get back, get back to the, back to school. So uh, I'll go to my third one, which is Doyle, the Doyle Early Education Center. And this, this space is predominantly uh, unit ventilators, but there's also an exhaust fan that appears to have uh, air um, ductwork distributed through the space to be able to promote airflow. Um, you know, from a lot of times when the outside air comes through the unit ventilators, schools may have exhaust fans to help promote that airflow through the space from the unit ventilator. And this, this uh, 
early childhood center appears to have that. We weren't able to trace out all the ducts because there was a lot of hard ceilings in that area. So from, from what we were able to trace out, that's what we saw it looked like the operation was. Um, so those unit ventilators were roughly between 400 and 700 CFM and about 100 to 300 CFM of outdoor air. So they were on the smaller side. Uh, those, ranged, those ranged in air change rate between air to air change to two air changes um, based on the space. And again, uh, we kind of observed the same thing as the last school as Dolbear, where we saw that there were a number of dampers that didn't seem to be fully open or operating properly. So we've come up with action items for those as well. The other thing I would just note, in addition to what I noted before for uh, recommended short-term solutions, is also in the in these schools that have exhaust fans, um, we would recommend to run them continuously to continue to promote that throughput of air. And also, one thing I'm sorry I didn't mention from the report in the other two schools, but pretty much applies to all of them, is in this time period, we would recommend potentially running the systems a little before the day starts, after, roughly about two hours before, two hours after at least, just to promote more flow out of the space and, you know, after the end of the day, just to promote more airflow before anything is shut down. So, yeah, you know, th there are trade-offs because it will expend a little more energy, but at this point in time, we think it's the, the proper operation. Peter, do you want to you wanna pick it up from yeah. there? The other schools? Sure. Yes. So um, I'll go to the uh, smallest one first, I guess, or the easiest one. Uh, Greenwood Elementary School. So this school does actually does not really have mechanical ventilation other than the um, floor mounted uh, supply fan in the basement that uh, distribute. This is an old school, so it, it distributes the, the air throughout these uh, um, heating uh, ducts to to the classrooms, but but for you know for the purposes of our evaluation, we we're we're really saying that you know we should this should be treated as uh, very little uh, uh, to no ventilation through there. Um, we are recommending for the the windows to be utilized, uh, operable windows, because every space in the in the in the building that we found, uh, we had we didn't find any spaces that didn't have operable windows. Or we're, or we're all close enough to to windows where where those can be utilized. So um, that's a strategy that we are uh, recommending for uh, for this school. Um, there are some um, what is it called ceiling hung, uh, you know, just fans like like the ones you would have at, at possibly at home. Um, those we, we are not recommending for those not to be really used because they just recirculate the air inside the, each individual classroom and that's not really helpful it's uh, it's better to just get the you know have the air come in and and go right out instead of it being recirculated and recirculated uh, the same air over over people and uh, Ed mentioned about keeping uh, the exhaust or whatever, or uh, the HVC equipment operational for longer times, you know, before occupancy and after occupancy. So we're recommending the same thing here for that, for that floor mounted uh, ventilation fan in the basement uh, to keep it operational as much as possible, uh, turn it on before occupancy and keep it on after occupancy as much as possible, just to keep the, uh, just to flush out the space of any contaminants and keep the air uh, fresh in there uh, uh, as much as possible, and I understand that this fan uh, that this uh, school is getting uh, uh, a lot of these air purifiers as as well for the classrooms. So that's uh, that's definitely going to uh, help the space out. Yeah. Peter, can I can I interrupt for a second? This is Mike. Um, sure. So I, Bob, I don't know if you're going to just go back and go through all the schools and what the town's going to do based on the recommendations afterwards, or if you want to do it by school. So, what what we're thinking is, you know, there's there's a couple there were some areas where we couldn't, uh, for whatever reason, we couldn't access. So we're gonna go back into those areas and uh, and take our readings. Uh, but we do have a pretty good idea of what to expect in those rooms, just because um, 
um, this, this is actually the Galvin School. We had a we had a little issue with uh, with access to some of the some of the spaces, but but the spaces that we were able to measure measure were were giving us good airflow readings. And um, if there you know other than there being some kind of mechanical issue or something not operational, we don't really expect there to be a much of much of a problem. So we'll go back in there and test those. I mean, and and if there's equipment that we identified as needing remediation, such as not working unit ventilators or fan coil units or or something like that, you know, once those get repaired, we can we can go back in as well and 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 take an take an air measurement of and and put that on you know on our list to just to, so we have that and, and know what the actual air changes are in those spaces. Does that did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I, my question was more to Bob. Thanks, Peter, for the explanation. Oh. But Bob, I know you would kind of come in and you weren't sure where we ended up, and you started talking about some action items with Greenwood. Do you want to go back and do all the schools after Peter and Ed are done providing their assessment? Yeah. So, Mike, we 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 would take their assessment with. Uh, in accordance with DPW because they kind of have the trades guys and, and we would look at them to help us out in, in assessing things and fixing things. So um, kind of, I guess to your question is with like Greenwood and, and what the actionable items are, um, we would, we would look at each school and say, what can we, what can we fix or what, what can we do in accordance with what BALA's recommendations are Um so, so realistically, I mean, we could go school by school, but I mean, really, we would look at DPW as the uh, as the trades guys and owners of the the physical plant to look and say, hey, this is what Paul has suggested. What can what can you guys do could help to help us out to fix fix items? Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of the items that we had observed, um, you know, typically will be corrected by. You know whatever facility staff has uh, has ownership of the the school facilities, and then if there there is if there's not one available, then they'll bring on a contractor to do. But most of the items can be corrected by facility staff, and then if we do find one that just goes above and beyond that, then the next step would be to to bring in a contractor to help troubleshoot. All right. I just have um, a quick comment. So. Um, Mike, I think this is kind of what you were um, trying to suggest. Maybe we should let Bala um, give the reports per each school, and then maybe once they're done, um, we can obviously ask questions during it, but maybe once they're done, we can sort of have Bob um, give us kind of like a run through of maybe what they plan to do at each school, um, you know, in terms of what their Bala's recommendations are. And then we can kind of just tie it up in that way, if that makes sense to everybody. Thank you. All right, Peter, you want to move on to the next one? Yeah. Okay. So uh, moving on, I'll move on to uh, Galvin um, Middle School. So this is the, I think this is the newest school in the district. Um, it's got some, uh, more uh, more controls and better filtration and newer units and and most spaces if uh, pretty much all spaces are ventilated heated um, air conditioned uh, there's uh, rooftop units with some with some uh, advanced filtration you know we saw MERV 14 filtration we saw uh, some other um, energy re recovery systems which uh, you know, which will allow the air handlers to run in uh, almost 100% uh, outdoor air mode. Um, there's ventilation being directly delivered to classrooms. There's also fan coil units in the classrooms that, that are similar to, uh, uh, to unit ventilators. Uh, they circulate, you know, space air uh, with potentially some outdoor air, filter it, uh, heat it. Um, and, and uh, possibly cool it as well. So we were able to take most readings in the spaces. We haven't found that many issues. Uh, the readings that we took were, were pretty good. You know, there were, uh, other, you know, uh, just as far as airflow 
exchange rate, you know, we were anywhere from two to five was 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 pretty pretty typical. You know, we had a, a few readings where we, we weren't able to get because there was the uh, uh, the fan coil units inside the space were not were not running. So we're recommending for those to be uh, looked at by you know by the facility staff to make sure that there's no operational issues with them. Um, and there's also some rooms that um, we weren't able to access, which but we're, which we're planning on going back in, and 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 revisiting and taking taking air readings there. Um, the larger spaces in the building are also served by um, rooftop air handling equipment with uh, you know that providing air that's filtered, and those can be uh, a lot of that though that equipment can be run um, in. 100% outdoor air mode um, as well. So this is a this is a newer school, and the, you know some some of the systems that we were looking at as well. They uh, some of the equipment could have just shut down because of scheduling or of energy uh, conservation uh, measures that were implemented for for the, for these newer systems. So uh, one of the recommendations that we are making is to uh, look at the schedules that this, this these these equipment is set up for, and and it might be easier to do in this building than, than some of the others. Is just set up, do an extended operational schedule for for the equipment and keep it running longer in the mo in the morning and in the afternoon to uh, do a pre-flush in the morning and an after flush in the afternoon after after uh, occupants have left and before occupants um, arrive. Um, areas that were maybe a little bit low. Um, you know they could they could benefit from uh, from your air purifiers uh, as well. That, that's pretty much it for uh, for Galvin. Does anybody have uh, questions? Do you also um, recommend the air purifiers at that school as well? If there is a location. Um, where it's low, you know, so some of these locations where we, readings where we took, where I mean, locations where we took readings, uh, we had some f uh, low readings, but maybe a, a fan call unit wasn't running uh, for whatever reason, and that's why we have the low readings. So, but you know, I, I'm thinking that once we get that fan call unit up and up and running, and we take a re we take the reading, uh, we sh we should be fine. So, um, maybe a location or two, depending on uh, you know final final results. Uh, of our measurements. Um, and a a Amy, this is Bob. Um, as for the, I know you mentioned, just mentioned air purifiers. We, uh, we got 100 air purifiers in delivered on um, Thursday and we distributed them to all the interior classrooms that are in use um, or plan to be in use for the school year. Um, but we still have additional ones that, that are extra left over and additional ones on the way. So, um, you know, if there is spaces or are spaces that need air purifiers we have them to uh to to be provided and put in place you know asap um in the event that to to create the air exchanges that are requested or needed or required per cdc so we do have those or we have them coming in um to provide those air exchanges yeah and amy what we'll do uh also is you know with the initial round of airflow measurement uh, it was pretty much to identify what the airflow was and if there were any noticeable issues with the equipment. And then in going through with uh, Bob and the facility staff, once we can uh, make sure those are corrected and know what the final airflow measurements are, we will work with, with him to say, okay, this one, this is the best you're going to get for an air change rate um, in order to bump it up. You know, it, uh, a good s solution is to supplement it with an air purifier. So we'll help. Um, work with him to understand which spaces would require them and which ones wouldn't. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, Peter, you want to just go through the last one? Yep. So the last one is uh, the Mor Memorial High School. And uh, Mor Memorial High School is uh, like some of the schools that Ed described with the unit ventilators and, uh, and air handling units for larger spaces, but on just on a grander uh, grander scale uh, classrooms that are outside or at the perimeter of the building um, all pretty much have unit ventilators 
uh, classrooms and areas that are on the interior um, do have overhead ventilation from uh, from from rooftop air handling units or or ceiling hung air handling units and some air handling units that are in mechanical rooms. So um, it's similar recommendations to the other uh, schools. You know, we I think the, these unit ventilators are a little bit older. Um, we did find some readings were a little low, but then it was probably, and we made the recommendations for the outdoor air dampers on these unit ventilators to be looked at because it seemed like we were getting good airflow overall on the unit ventilators, but it's just the outdoor air portion of them uh, was a little, was short, you know, so that, that's just indicating to us that there's there's an issue with the outdoor air damper and maybe it's, uh, it's stuck in a position or it's not opening all the way or it's hung up uh, partially closed. So, so we have that list uh, out there for those to be looked at and we expect those rooms to uh, to have better better results. Um, as far as the air handling units for the larger spaces, you know, we uh, we are recommending for uh, for you know better filtration, maybe MERV 13 filters, two inch filters to be provided for those. Um, although those filters do cut down a little bit on the airflow, make the uh, the fans have to work work harder. Um, but we are making those uh, recommendations. Um, some exhaust fans also we found that we're not running, so um, we're making a recommendation to take a look at those. Uh, maybe the, the, those are usually simple reasons they don't run. Maybe a belt has broken. There's there's a lot of exhaust fans, so um, they should be they should be looked at and kept operational for extended period of time uh, as well as as in the other you know like we described for the other uh, schools um, and uh, air purifiers as well for the areas that are short you know if we get these dampers open and you know we find that we're still lacking of air for some reason then you know we can uh, we could make that recommendation as well for for the uh, for the for the air purifiers to be provided in the classrooms that are uh, being used. Um, Peter, I don't think I think we still had Walton to do, so I'll, I can touch on that one. Oh, so I'll um, I'll touch on that one and then uh, go through one other thing before we can open it up for questions. Um, so Walton, Walton School has, uh, has a lot of the same systems um, that was renovated not too long ago, but it still has uh, unit ventilators. And then there are package rooftop units that feed the administrative areas and then air handling units that feed some of the larger spaces. Um, one thing we did observe in, in Walton was a bunch of the air, uh, unit ventilators that were working were actually uh, providing a good amount of outside air. Um, which was in the range of roughly about three to five and even some that went beyond five air changes an hour. So that was, that was great to see. Uh, however, there were a number where uh, the operation, the outdoor air damper was not operating. So we had flagged them to go through and to be corrected. Um, so that, 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 was, that was what we observed in, in Walton. Uh, one thing I wanted to note about pretty much all the school systems how we address, how we kind of go through the steps of um, looking at how to improve the indoor air quality is, you know, pretty much the way you the way you look at it is through providing additional air changes uh, via either outdoor air or with supplemental needs like air purifiers that have a high amount of recirculated highly filtered air, and both of those can go into the calculation. And what that does is it helps dilute any of the contaminants in the space. Um, we also look at the systems themselves to see if they can accommodate more efficient uh, filtration for a unit ventilator. I'm going to throw out these terms, which may probably probably will mean nothing to everybody, but a uh, typical unit ventilator will have like a MERV 8 filter. And all that is is a measure of the efficiency of the filter, of how it can, how much uh, fine particles it can capture. And 
Um, a lot of the recommendations out there right now are for MERV 13 and above, but those unit ventilators really can't accommodate those because the, because the filter is more dense, the additional pressure drop, the fans in the unit ventilators are really small horsepower and they can't overcome them. So once we get through those, looking at those two things, the next step is for supplementation. Like what can we put in there to help your dilute or filter it or, or potentially break down the pores? Um, there are technologies that I noted earlier, like you know bipolar ionization or um, UV light, which I would not suggest UV light in any schools because uh, there's not enough studies to show that it is not harmful if you come in contact with it. But bipolar ionization is one. And those are, those are more long-term strategies. Like I said, the, the more readily available quicker ones are the things that we've been noting. Um, but I just wanted to go through the process of kind of the things we look at to try to address indoor air quality. And it's really dilution, filtration, supplemental equipment. So I, I should have said that in the beginning, but now that we've gone through all the schools and kind of the, the, uh, the theme has kind of repeated itself, I wanted to just kind of describe how we got there. Uh, right, and we have those uh, covered, uh, sorry, just uh, saying that we have that, those recommendations covered in that phase one, those five phase one reports. Yes. So Ed and Peter, one question kind of getting somewhat to the crux of the matter. So you've talked about Yeah, it froze up, Mike. Yeah, froze up a little. Doug, so, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yep, now we can. Okay, sorry about oh, that. Yeah. So, so you talked about some schools have better air flow than others in that regard. So my question to you is, of all the schools you evaluated, do you have any concerns that we can't get up to more acceptable levels with short-term mitigation strategies? I just, do you want me to answer that, Ed, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, no, no, go right ahead. So just because I've been looking at these, schools, you know, in other districts as well. I don't see anything standing out here that's, uh, you know, that's would prevent us from, you know, getting getting to where we where we need to be, where, where we are lacking. You know, it's, uh, it's very, very typical stuff of what we've been seeing, you know, for other school districts as well, and other schools. So no real, no real standouts. Yeah, and the fact that, um, that Bob has mentioned that the uh, the school district is already taking um, you know precautions to uh, procure you know air purifiers um, and you know we'll be looking at the units to making sure that we can get the most outside air that we can and then supplementing it with windows all those things really together will will you know we're confident can get you to the air change rate that would be Know, deemed ex, you know acceptable or what what you want to shoot for for good air indoor air quality for the schools great thank you i just had um another quick question i think um for the doyle you had mentioned for recommendations just to you know run the um the systems two hours before school two hours after did you, um, do you uh, is, that, uh, is that the only recommendation for Doyle or do you also suggest the air purifiers as well? No, no, no. Yeah, the, sorry, the, the recommendations for Doyle were the same as the other ones with respect to um, te testing the units, um, the uh, unit ventilators, because there were, there were a lot of fluctuations in the airflow that were recorded for Doyle. And we did notice some um, controls and dampers that didn't seem to be operating properly. So we'll, we'll need to, the facility staff will need to go through those. And I would still recommend the windows air purifiers. The one thing I just wanted to mention um, on top of that was because I noted the central exhaust fan that we should run that continuously. And the, I, I, I know it didn't come across uh, right, but the, the, note I made about running the systems longer and you know before and after longer um, that's really a, a global recommendation for all, all of the schools right and then just um, recommendations for the high school um, you know it, obviously you had mentioned um, some of the things need to sort of be repaired like the exhaust vents um, 13, 
you had 13 filters with the two inch screens or whatever um, that could cut, cut down on the airflow. Do you obviously use air purifiers? Anything else at the high school that you have recommendations for? I mean, it's the it's basically going to be the same recommendations as for the other spaces. You know, to uh, whatever we noted where we were short on airflow to you know to repair those outdoor air dampers on the unit ventilators um the the, the filtration that you just mentioned the upgrading the filtration um uh, and uh, you know the pre purifiers as well uh were needed so uh, well, the same same type of recommendations yeah and keeping the systems lo running longer you know just just like i had mentioned one thing, Peter, to add to that, though, right, we did notice a number of the spaces are fed by the ceiling mounted heating and ventilating units. And, sure. and those typically, those units, you know, both in all the schools, you know, where the package rooftop units are and the uh, indoor ceiling mounted, uh, what we call H and V units, those typically have fans with higher horsepower um, uh, allowed. And uh, those are prime candidates for seeing what level of increased filtration you can put up there. Um, you know, a lot of those older h and units will still have like Mervade filters and have the potential because they're an air handling unit, not just a unit ventilator, to accommodate those higher efficiency filters. What you kind of have to do is when the, the facility staff is gonna go through and check them out, you can see what level of filtration will be able to be optimized by not compromising the airflow too much because it's kind of a delicate balance because you want to increase the filtration, but you don't want to lower your airflow too much because the air, the quantity of air helps you as well. So you kind of have to, you kind of have to, especially with these older existing systems, you just kind of have to test it out while you're looking at them. Uh, thanks, Amy. I think you said it's <laughs> um, for, for Ed or Peter. Um, specifically at the uh, high school and Greenwood older buildings that haven't been updated, um, you know, I'm sure you were told that we are um, on tap for uh, renovating or rebuilding our high school. So did you, did you identify any classrooms or any spaces that were deemed inoccupable, inoccu that's a hard word to say, <laughs> inoccupable? <laughs> um, even if we were to put, like say in the interior classrooms at the high school, putting in the air purifiers, I think it, it seems like you've said that that will get us to a space that is acceptable. Um, but I just wanted to see if there were any that were red flags, any spaces and particularly in those couple schools. So, so for, for, for the high school, there was, uh, I think everything pretty much was ventilated to a degree. So, uh, you know, if we get those ventilation systems, uh, even the ones that had uh, some kind of an issue with them up and running, then and supplemented with the with the air purifiers and get the the some of the exhaust fans that you know we found that weren't running um, up and running, then there's I don't I don't think there's any spaces that we would deem not occupiable other than you know maybe a, a, a closet or something that wouldn't be wouldn't be ventilated, you know, nobody would really hang out in there too much. <laughs> they shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> they shouldn't be, yeah. There were, there were also a couple of unit ventilators that weren't, appear, didn't appear to be working. Um, so when we're, the facility staff is going through, if there is a major issue with them, the good thing is, at least in the short term, you can utilize outdoor uh, 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 windows to, to get what you need. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. We have any other questions for Ed or Peter? Uh, I can't see the screen, so. Susie, Susie has a question. Susie, yeah. thank you, Susie. Thanks, Mike, <laughs> Susie. Okay. And then Tom has a, a question after I do, after me, if you can't see him. Um, so I have a, a two-fold question. One uh, question for Ed and Peter and one for um, Bob. So I think um, the big question, Ed, for you is assuming that we can get some of these mitigation strategies in place like reviewing the dampers, getting air purifiers into the rooms, 
agreeing that we can get those systems running earlier in the day and later in the day. I don't think that later in the day is gonna be a problem. I'm, I'm wondering about the earlier in the day piece and then any kind of filter changes that need to happen. Do you, would you, in your professional opinion, say that we're safe to go back to school on Tuesday in, the, in a way where we've got students and staff coming in kind of every day? Sure. Um, that, that it, it's a good question. And it's one that has implications that go beyond the HVAC systems. And so the, you know, what, what we're talking about is to try to help improve indoor air quality and help from uh, the HVAC systems help mitigate any kind of airborne contaminants from spreading through the, through the schools. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about. But when you get into, you know, safety of schools, there's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot of procedures. There's a lot of things like, you know, I, I kind of preface it in the fact that if there are two children sitting in close proximity to one another and they're not going by CDC and state guidelines for separation masks, things that, you know, just procedures, I could dump a million CFM in there and it's not going to do anything. Um, so I, I hesitate. Following the, the CDC guidelines, which less yeah. kids in the classroom, six feet between, between yep. three feet between desks, desks, everybody wearing masks, which you, right, you guys have no control over. So that's totally a fair. <laughs> so right. So the context of ventilation and HVAC system. Ventilation and HVAC, yes. I think with the studies we've seen and promoting getting to those higher level of air changes and with the means of um, fixing the mechanical systems, making sure they're working to design, supplementing with their purifiers. Yes, I think, I think the, from what we've seen, the school district would be doing everything they can to make you know, a, a safe environment with respect to the HVAC systems. Okay, thank you. And then Bob, how realistic is it to think that we can do these set of things over the weekend and on Monday, right? Like, it's great that we've already got air purifiers in place, right? But it sounds like there's gonna be an effort by the DPW staff to get around to the schools and check out these dampers. And, you know, and granted, Peter, you said that you guys have seen other schools be able to kind of work through that checklist in a, in a relatively quick period of time. But Bob, just interested in kind of your take on the DPW's ability to kind of um, do what needs to get done and, the, you know, and your staff as well. Yeah, so Susie, uh, I mean, a lot of the checklists, we'd have to have kind of a list and checkpoint. And like you said, it's how quick can the DPW do this? I don't think any, any of this has, um, has anything to do with the custodial staff. So um, realistically, it, it would be getting the checklist of, the, of what needs to be done and, and asking the DPW to do so. So, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for you right now um, on how soon they could do it because I, I don't want to speak for the DPW. Um, so I, I honestly don't have an answer for you on that. Okay. So I think I can add some information for the, for the group and just speaking quickly um, this afternoon with, with Steve Mayo, <coughs> excuse me, and Joe Conway, the director of the DPW. Um, you know, Steve had said that, you know, they're prepared to commit resources, to commit time, uh, manpower to get this squared away. Um, and, and they've already started this work um, and I know that the, in terms of replacing filters and making sure things are running, they have kind of a running list of the work that they have already completed. They've already started the work in regard to kind of framing um, frames that will hold exhaust fans for, for Greenwood. And so, you know, I, I think the, the question is, I, I think your question is in regard to timeline, how quickly can we get these items done you know, if, if their cup is half full, I think I'm encouraged to hear, correct me if I'm off Ed, right? But I think what I'm hearing is that um, there's nothing glaring that, you know, where we have a series of, of rooms that, you know, are, are, are kind of where univentilators aren't working or that they're unsafe. And so, but there are things like dampers and things like filters and things that the, you know, install an air purifier which would kind of put us in a better place if we haven't already put an air purifier in, correct? The, the, yeah, you, you are correct, Doug. I mean, we, we didn't see anything glaring that was like, you know, even if a piece of equipment, it, it, 
isn't working, it's local and can be supplemented enough with access to outside air and the air purifiers that, you know, that, that, that's a good place to be. You know, there weren't any rooms where it's like, hey, it's an interior room and, you know, even with an air purifier, there's no access to outside air. There's no access to get any throughput of air. Something like that, we would flag and say, listen, you should really not utilize this room until something can be done. Right. So, really didn't see, you know, there were, um, there were a couple of rooms that I noted on the report that we want to follow up on where I think that that might be the case, but they were very small and more like administrative areas that can be isolated and not stop. Nothing that would stop an entire school from being, you know, uh, worked in. Thank you. Bob, is that fair to say? Would you like to add anything to that? Or do you feel like that's a, a good kind of summer, summarization of, of kind of where we're at? I'm 0 for 2 today and calling on Bob. <laughs> um, I think he's on mute. <laughs> So I, go ahead, Mike. I cut you off. I was just, just kind of, I think Bob's just ignoring you, Doug. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time or the last time either. <laughs> so maybe um, we can just wait until Bob is available. I, I think Tom Markham, you had a question as well. If you want to ask, I, I guess I did. I, I thank you, um, and and thank you for this uh, for the support and and for this information and the and, and the and the ongoing work. Certainly, uh, there's more for us to learn, uh, but this has been uh, an incredibly informative couple of weeks, especially literally uh, the last hour or so. So certainly, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, with regard to the high school, I'd like to, like to uh, ask a couple of questions, particularly particularly there. Um, your last your 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 last answer, Ed, to Doug's question. Um, certainly gave me uh, gave me a sense of, of uh, relief and I just want to I just want to appreciate that I understand exactly what you said <clears throat> you were saying that um, that the rooms in the high school by and large were were operable with a couple of spaces you identified those mostly being administrative spaces um, oh um, uh, actually what, what I was making reference to was one of the other schools that I noted uh, not, I, I, I was just making general um, statement, not, not directly related to the high school. And looking at the- yeah. So, so can, you, can you answer the question specifically around the high school? Sure, sure. So, uh, thank you. So go ahead, Peter. Did you, so as far as the, the, the high school, we did not find areas that just uh, were, had no ventilation. I mean, there's a place we have to, uh, there's a room, couple of rooms we still need to get into, which we haven't gotten into, but we have to verify. But I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that they're, they're probably ventilated because everything pretty much has been. Um, you know, there are locations where we had some low airflow, but that was, that's probably due to, you know, an issue with the unit ventilator or, or the overhead HVAC wasn't uh, operational at the time. So we have to uh, recheck some of those areas, but, um, but like, you know, like, like Ed and, and Doug were saying, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all localized. Uh, you know, mo most areas are, are, are fine. And if there's an area that needs a supplemental, uh, air purifier or, you know, uh, then, then that can be added and, and made, made, made occupied. Uh, you can occupy that space, you know, I mean, in an air purifier in a typical classroom, uh, might give you up to three additional air changes, you know, equivalent air changes um, for that for that space. So if we have a have a degree of air there, you know, if we had one, if we have a classroom that has two unit vents and one is not running, uh, you can supplement it with an extra with a with a with an extra uh, air purifier, and you should be a, you know near or or past that uh, five air changes, along with the with the, with the operable windows. If you can keep them open uh, now, then um, that, that's even even better. Yeah, yeah, Peter, and just to Peter, just to jump on top of that too. In looking through the high school specifically, um, there were some you know, unit ventilators that were noted that it didn't look like they were working. And you know, if it is, if it comes that we find out through troubleshooting that it's something major with them, 
the fact that those unit ventilators are on the perimeter and have access to operable windows is okay because in the short term that will give you uh, access to the fresh air that you need. Right. Peter and Ed, you guys have mentioned several times in, during this meeting about rechecking and I'm sort of curious what is the current plan? Are we going to do some short-term mitigation? Are you guys coming back to recheck again to make sure that we did see acceptable levels of improvement, if you will? Yeah. So that, I think that's a yeah, two-part question because there's areas where we were not able to get in for whatever reason. And then, so we, we do want to get in those areas and just take our initial readings. There wasn't that many of them, but you know, there, there's some. So we can, we can do that, uh, you know, almost immediately. And, but then there's, you know, there's areas that will get m mitigated and uh, uh, we, we haven't really discussed that too much, but we can, uh, we can return and uh, look look at look at those as well, you know, to see if there's an improvement on the uh, on the airflow. Now that you know we have a unit ventilator running, we should, we can we can, you know, uh, once we get this list back, we can go back in and spend some time going through the list and uh, re-examining those rooms. Yeah, for example, if if an outside air damper on a unit ventilator was stuck in half position and it was able to be corrected and opened up fully, we can retake that reading to make sure you're getting more. Uh, you know, what, what level of outside air you'd be getting, right? So I, I think I can yeah. add. Just a, um, just a quick um, note, excuse me, just a quick note. I know that Tom had some more questions. So I want to give you the opportunity, Tom, to continue if you need to. Yes, thank you, Amy. I, yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, so Peter, back to uh, your, your, your last comments regarding um, high school and the ventilation. I guess I'm pleased to see that there is ventilation all over, some of which was not running at the time of your, um, of your, of your walkthroughs and your investigation. Would it be reasonable to say, or fair to say, or accurate to say, that uh, the ones that weren't uh, are working at the time of your walkthroughs, it's because they weren't on, or it's because they were broken and actually not functioning? I would say uh, most likely they were uh, they were they were turned off and weren't weren't operational. Um, there's always a possibility that a belt could have snapped or you know this is a mechanical equipment that turns on turns off. So so something could have happened, uh, but it most likely just wasn't uh, it just wasn't uh, running. You know. Right. Oh, good. And that's certainly good to hear because that has been my sort of, you know, working assumption as we met with um, Lost you know, you. The, the facilities team pretty, pretty regularly. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I said that that has been my, uh, my working assumption. I wanted to, I uh, wanted to be able to uh, clarify that. So it's good to, it's good to be able to hear that. Um, also, uh, with regard to um, our capacity to open, uh, you know, windows um, to make sure that that we're getting enough air, you know, air circulation. Um, obviously, you know, something that I think was even going back to some of the original comments that Ed made at the very beginning was that is practicable only for a certain amount of, you know, weeks or months, right? It's going to become cold soon. So that is not a long-term solution, even though in the course of the, the course of the winter windows can be opened as needed. But uh, would it be fair to say, certainly in the short term, that it would be reasonable and safe to use that in the opening of windows as a mitigation while other you know fixed construction activity is going on um yeah yes yes that would that uh, utilizing operable windows would be your best source of um air exchange it really does because even you know even with some conservative calculations that we've done um, at a variety of different schools, um, the with depending on where the prevailing winds are, um, you can get a very good air change rate with use of operable windows. Now, uh, to add on to that, a lot of you know the best the best throughput that you would get is to you know open the windows and then open the door to the classroom, and then allow that cross ventilation. However, in this type of scenario, you really don't want to open that door because if there are any contaminants, yes, the air will bring in, and that's the, the intent of it is to try to dilute it. And you may not get the most throughput 
by closing that door because the air has to come in and then go out other windows. However, it's better to have the less air throughput than to have doors open to the corridor and allow any contaminants to spread out of the room. So control, controlling it the best you can with isolating the space is actually the way to go in a situation like this. And there are a lot of classrooms that actually have exhaust fans um, that are put in, you know, when during the generation of the school and how it was designed, you'll have the univentilators and then you'll have an exhaust grill. And if you have that, that's kind of the best of both worlds because that will promote that uh, cross ventilation when the windows are open as much as it can. Okay. And uh, one more question, uh, again, particularly around the high school, although it's probably going to apply, uh, you know, everywhere. Um, are there any devices that you would recommend that we as a school district uh, uh, procure that would allow us and our staff to be able to measure, you know, air quality from time to time? And how regularly would you suggest time to time is? Uh, daily, twice a week, bi-monthly, uh, bi-weekly, rather, anything? Yeah, so I mean, it's, you know, we, what we measure, you know, we can expect um, for those systems to pretty much operate in that fashion on, until something dramatic happens or, you know, even like the unit ventilators, they, um, they have filters, those filters load up um, and that does cut down a little bit on the, you know, some percentage of, of the air. But uh, just without even any equipment, you be you know if the ventilation is is running. You know you uh, if you walk into an interior classroom and there's and it's stale in there and and uh, and you go up to the vent, you know you get, take a calibrated piece of toilet paper and put it up to the vent and it's not moving any air, then you know the ventilation um, mm -hmm. is not is not running. Sure. Um, and you can kind of you you can just just. Uh, you can just sense it, how much how much air you know is kind of if it if it's if it's running cor the way it was always running or is it, or or has has it changed? But yeah, there are devices out there that you can uh, you can measure with. But you know, I it's you you kind of have to understand the limitations of those measurements and uh, and how you're taking them and what mode the equipment is in and. And is that airs that are you reading return air, outdoor air, supply air, exhaust air, return air? So there's there's a lot of new, new nuance to it, you know. So so I, I, but but the the thing that you get the most bang for the buck is if you know just check if the ventilation is is running, you know. It's, uh, Peter, are you if, being air out of the computer? If I can jump on that too, um, Tom. One thing to note is uh, what Peter's noting and what we performed was really airflow quantity measurement to show how much is coming in and what how the systems are running. If you're talking about like air quality measurement, which is more of, hey, there's so many parts per million of a certain contaminant or CO2 level or whatever it is, um, the, there are devices available. You know, a lot of times that type of air quality testing would be done by like an environmental health and safety company. But yeah. there, there, are, there are devices that you can buy. They are rather expensive. Um, but you could get ones that continuously, you know, will mount on a wall and continuously monitor them. Um, there are companies that sell them, but then that would get into like, you know, how many parts per million of certain things are in there, which is not kind of what we did, which is more quantity of air that's moving. Right. And, and, right. No, and, th and so thank you, Ed, for hopping on to that answer, because I, cause I very much, I appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things that we don't want, right, is we don't want, um, we want to be able to know what we need to know uh, without creating sort of an overload of, of data, right? We can get, we can get too much information um, about things that really aren't going to drive, uh, you know, quality um, or certainly aren't going to drive any, you know, uh, health or safety risk. Right. We, we need to be able to balance, uh, we need to be able to balance that in, a, in, a, in an honorable way. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of, if, if I could just jump in quick, Tom, and that's one of the reasons why we've kind of, um, we, we, in talking to a lot of districts, we've referenced that Harvard School of Public Health study because in dealing with like the air change rates, it, it, it's, it's something that's tangible and understandable, you know, to say, hey, you know, there are technologies out there that will treat the air, you know, break down the virus. There are different systems that require, you know, return air, um, high efficiency filtration. 
by kind of boiling it down to that air change rate and the fact that a highly reputable um, uh, organization or institution like the School of Public Health is talking about those air changes and the benefit of them, we feel it's a good way to express it, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. No, and, and I appreciate that. So, and I'm glad this is this is where I where, where I wanted to get back to the 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 the, the number of air changes, <clears throat> um, and I'm glad you mentioned the uh, re, re mentioned the Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Uh, that information or that their recommendations um, are post you know COVID or during the COVID world, right? They just came out the end of August, and they were directly in rely. They put out a number of documents directly in relation to the pandemic. So, uh, and that was my appreciation, uh, or that was my understanding from your earlier remarks. W where I'm going with this is is sort of a boots on the ground, you know, reality check. Um, that that information being relatively new, how likely is that to apply to many places that that aren't, um, you know, necessarily meeting that standard? I, I can. You know, I can. Harvard comes out. We all know how how smart they are are over there. Um, but if that doesn't apply in the world of reality, you know, where are we going to, we can shut the world down again. I mean, I need right. to, we need to have a balance between the functionality of the devices that we do have um, and their capacity uh, to function properly and within acceptable ranges versus, you know, meeting a extraordinarily high new standard, however appropriate it may be. But still, is it so new, no one's going to meet it yet. Right. And I can tell you with utmost certainty that the, if you looked at the highest performing, performing building out there, it probably does not meet the air change rate that you're talk, that Harvard School of Public Health is talking about. Um, you know, the typical, you, you know, what we as engineers always designed to in the past, pre-pandemic, has always been to either meet or slightly exceed the ventilation rates that are dictated by the code or by ASHRAE, which is a standard for um, HVAC systems design. And, um, you know, those are in the range for a, for a school classroom in the range of that, you know, two, one, one and a half to two and a half, depending on the occupancy. Um, so a lot of times, you know, I've, I've been on calls recently with schools that have just recently built and or in the construction and they're like well why didn't we plan to this and i'm like well nobody planned to this because this is something that is addressing a situation that um we've never seen before and has never been uh discussed for ventilation rates before it's it's something in quick response to try to dilute um at a higher rate contentious within the space um pro you know based against what was acceptable what was acceptable was really just looking at ventilation rates for people um, for it to be healthy from a breathing standpoint. So then, uh, are the number of of air changes within within our within the buildings of our school district are between one and a half and two and a half. Is that what you're saying? Well, it depends. Um, some of some of the schools were there, and some of the schools were less that we identified that there could be issues with the outside air dampers, which is what we put together as an action list to be addressed. Okay. But in particular at the high school, was the high school within that within that acceptable range of air exchange? Um, I'm looking at it now and cool. for the systems that were operating correctly, it actually looked yes, it looked good. There yeah. were there were areas that were below that and a lot of them we flagged that they should be checked. Yeah. So the, the, the ones with the unit ventilators that were operating the way we would expect them to, they, they actually had really good air changes on them. Um, the ones, right, like Ed said, we got to check the dampers on them and, and stuff like that. Those need help. Um, some of the overhead ventilation was a little bit, was a little bit lower, but still, you know, I was just had some reading. So, but it's still like, you know, 1.9, 1 1.6. So it's still, it still had more than in that range, you know, was within within that range, and you could supplement those, you know, even if you have a 1.9 reading in an interior classroom or a room. I think this is a room because it's smaller than I'm looking at. Um, an air purifier in a smaller room will will do a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of air changes where it's you know it supplies quite a bit of air. Yeah, and we and we also um, and we also. 
we we also um, are curious, Tom, to to see going forward how the uh, mechanical code and how the ASHRAE ventilation standards are going to change going forward for how we will need to design uh, our ventilation systems because you know based on this and that's why that's why right now you know we're trying to think of um, you know short term practical ways to up that air change rate and improve that indoor air quality with fil you know filtration and um, air purification and additional outside air because you know it's quite possible that the next range of of uh, systems design that we go through with schools will bump up that outside air. However, it's a fine line because by doing that, you increase the amount of energy that the buildings will expend. And as you know, for the past 20 years, we've been focusing on energy efficiency when it comes to health of buildings. So it's really interesting how the design approaches are gonna change going forward with respect to what we you know, look into as a healthy building. Hey, Doug, I'm um, sorry, uh, Tom. So I had a question for you, Doug, and we started to have that conversation. This was a great conversation. Thank you both very much for all the information. So soon we move forward. So we're DPW is going to have all all hands on deck to get things as close to perfect as we can before next next Tuesday. How do you see things progressing afterwards? So I, I think you know we'll we'll continue, Mike, to monitor how spaces are working, how are working how kids are able to access and participate in their learning. Um, and it's literally, Mike, gonna be, you know, a day-to-day -day event. You know, I think one of the things that we would be um, remiss if, if we didn't kind of stay focused on the fact that we're still in a national health crisis. Um, we do need to be prepared for, you know, whatever happens in regard to the transmission of the virus in our community, but in regard to our planning, Mike, you know, we, you know, based on what I heard from Ed, and Ed, please chime in after I after I make the statement. But based on your information and his information, uh, I'm feeling like we should continue to move forward with this and and work on and get together with DPW on Monday, um, and provide any adjustments to dampers or anything like that. But you know, and and barring any change in public health data um, or barring any change in mechanical information that we don't yet have, uh, I think, you know, we, we plan to move forward. Um, and, and, but again, making it um, slowly um, and surely, right? And, and while being prepared to make any changes that we need to make. Did I answer your question, Mike? All right. Uh, I do. I do. Um, just have one quick question. Um, right. Is it the same information and/or protocols with hallways as well, in terms of the airflow? Um, I'll say. No. Go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. So, as far as the hallways, some um, uh, the hallways are mostly not ventilated in the schools. I think maybe in Galvin they are ventilated. I can't remember off the top of my head. I would, check but some some hallways are unventilated and some are not typically what i what we've seen in other school districts and uh even you know here as well is that hallways get very little to no ventilation and that's uh we really i don't think uh ed correct me if i'm wrong i don't think we've been really making we're not treating them as occupied spaces you know just transition uh, spaces and and there's they, you know, per uh, the mechanical code, they don't really uh, require ventilation. So they've never been designed for maybe vestibules and places like that. But but as far as the hallways, they're, they're mostly unventilated. And if they are ventilated, it's bare minimum, very little. In the in the older schools, um, I agree with you, Peter. We, we have seen um, little to no ventilation um, in the current mechanical code. Uh, you know, ventilation is required for hallways, even though they are transient spaces, it is less than, you know, fully occupiable spaces, but it, it is required. But it's not atypical um, to, for older schools or even, you know, 20, 30, you know, 20, 25 year old schools.
to see um, a little, a small amount of ventilation. Some some school designs also would have um, would heat would heat the um, corridors when necessary, but also could have general exhaust in that area. So we've we've seen a mixed bag, but it's not atypical to see little to no ventilation in corridors. I just wanted to um, point out and confirm uh, with Doug or Bob that we have to made the decision not to have students occupy the locker spaces um, in any of the buildings. Is that right, Doug and Bob? Yeah, so Colleen, I believe uh, all the uh, administration staff at each school has, uh, has locked off each locker or cubby um, location, so we, they are not utilizing those spaces. Then they're not they're not spending um, you know the the normal amount of time that they would in those spaces, and they're they're really not even um, changing classes in the same manner as they normally would be. You're, you're that, spot on, Colleen. That's correct. So with so a lot of the hallways, especially at the high school, are one way hallways, and when students are changing classes, they'll be kind of administrators positioned at at the corners to make sure that students are not kind of congregating, make sure they're staying socially distant, make sure that they're kind of continuing to wear their masks. And, and based on the students, we've, we had seniors in today, um, and based on the, the all four classes that we had in this week, we didn't have any problem with students passing or wearing masks or anything like that. To be honest, they were, they were just terrific. They were really great, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments for Ed or Peter? Can anybody see any? Tom, yeah. Well, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, my, so my, my question is, is sort of, um, so what's next, guys? What, what remains undone um, or in, in terms of, you know, as the dominoes fall, what is your next set of work uh, in completion of your scope expected um, you know, so expected of you. What's next? For 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 us, right? For uh, yes, we we have some reading. We have some readings that we have to come back and take that were for rooms that were 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 locked and we couldn't get into. Uh, mostly at the uh, at the Galvin School, and and some other spaces. Uh, I think a couple spaces in the high school and uh, a few so spaces in the other schools. Okay, and then um, and then we'll. We're gonna work with with Bob and his group to, you know, go through the list of identified systems that we feel may have deficiencies or need to be checked. Um, and then, if they have any questions when they're going through, just be available to answer those questions. And then once they once they go through that effort, um, we'll just need to follow up with Doug and Bob about what ne what the next steps are from there. And, and uh, you. You cut out the final final report or or, or I'm sorry are you guys expected to uh, submit sort of a final final report I know you've submitted some 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 draft not really draft reports but some some um, you know you know in, in, um, in progress reports as well as some executive summaries yes. is there going to be a concluding document there, there will be yes and and what do we what can we see as a timeline um, like well, like when are you planning to be able to come back into the buildings and complete the work that's not yet done? What do you see as a timeline? Um, it's a very good question. I mean, I, I think we, we are available um, as of the beginning of the next week, and Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, to take care of the readings of the spaces we couldn't get into. Um, and then mm -hmm. the support for Bob and his staff um, on any of the changes that, or you know, review and modifications that need to be made. Doug, I'm assuming that will probably have a start on Monday and we're available for that support. Right. So, so our, our plan, Tom, and, and, the, and the rest of the people on this call, our plan is to convene uh, Bob and his group along with DPW um, and Ed and, and Peter will kind of join us via Zoom and, and just really look at what can be done. Um, and, you know, we, we will report out Kind of in our next meeting, if there's anything significant that would pre preclude us from changing phases uh, on Tuesday, we would communicate that probably Monday evening, right? But based on the information that's being presented this evening, 
um, we feel like the we have an actionable plan um, and we feel like the information that's been provided indicates that the spaces are, are safe for our return. Great. And so, so could I just ask one more one more question in this in this sort of line of work uh, to be done uh, both over the weekend and on Monday with uh, school department staff and the DPW staff as well as you know Ed and Peter's team. Um, we would then we have a special another special school committee meeting on Tuesday night. Would we expect to have a uh, a, a more informed uh, report about everything that's been done and then on the what at that time would be the the previous three or four days? Yes, you would also be, we would also be um, I think prepared to talk about next steps. Um, if there's any long-term commissioning work or anything that we're seeking um, to do with BALA in terms of recommendations. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, gentlemen, for your work and your, and your candor this afternoon. You're thank welcome. You, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, any other last questions or comments? Colleen? Amy, there's a question in the chat from uh, Caitlin Dorenzo. Okay. She's asking about um, keeping the, I think that um, Ed spoke to this, uh, keeping the, their hallway doors closed to ensure better ventilation. I think he spoke to that and it was talking about isolating the, the air. Yeah, I would, I would at this point in time keep them closed. Um, and it's really to ensure better, better ventilation, but it's more to stop uh, to help mitigate any contaminants that may be in the room from spreading out to the corridors and then potentially to other spaces. And it's not, you know, it's not 100% because there are undercut to doors and things of that nature, but it will, it will definitely help this. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions or comments? Does anybody see any? Okay. Um, Doug, are we all set to move on? Yes. I think, I think we are. I think we have. Um, it's it's great having Ed and, and Peter here it's, and to hear directly from them in regard to this the state of our of our HVAC system. So, I I think we're prepared to move on. Our our plan is to again reconvene um, Bob his group along with DPW on on Monday morning um, to to get going on this right and so. So that's the plan. There'll also be more information forthcoming Tuesday evening um, in regard to maybe next steps, if there's any commissioning work or any additional support that we're gonna be working on or seeking through through Bala Engineering. Hey Doug, I, I'm sorry, uh, maybe it's a question for Bob. Bob, was my understanding incorrect? Is DPW going to be doing some work over the weekend as well or is everything gonna wait till Monday? Uh, I haven't been in touch with GPW, so it's not my understanding that they're going to be doing work over the weekend, Mike. Um, so okay. I, haven't, I, I haven't spoken with them today. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, moving on. Um, obviously, is that, does somebody have something else to say? Sorry. All set. Um, uh, future dates and agenda items. Um, obviously, Doug has mentioned that um, we do have another special school committee planned. Tuesday, September 29th at 7.30 via Zoom. Um, and with that, school committee comments, Tom Markham? <clears throat> uh, no, the only comment I would have, uh, I would be a thank you to, to everyone. Uh, certainly, you know, from, from Ed and, and Peter and your teams to certainly everyone on the facility staff and, and Bob and his teams to be able to get us to a place here today. Uh, we've got more to do, but the more information we have, the better able we all are to make decisions in support of, of the superintendent's actions. So I just want to thank everyone for, for being part of this conversation tonight. Thank you, Tom. Mike? I think Tom said it well. Thanks, everybody. We're, we're in a good place. We have more to do, but we're in a pretty good place. Thank you all. Thanks, Mike. Colleen? No further comment. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. So I, I'll just say that um, also thank you for, uh, for Bala getting on a phone call late on a Friday afternoon to share your um, perspectives. I think it's been incredibly um, informative. 
Um, and I'm certainly comfortable kind of moving forward with the plan as is of hybrid starting on Tuesday, kind of assuming that some of these mitigation um, short-term things are, are addressed around dampers and getting air purifiers into, into rooms, um, knowing that there's still some more work to do. But I think if we can say that that work can be done on Monday, that we could all feel um, good that we've done kind of the, uh, what we need to do in order to feel uh, like teachers and students are safe coming into school on, on Tuesday. Um, so I'm, I look forward to kind of hearing the, the additional pieces of, of information, but I think you guys provided a tremendous amount of, of information today that's super useful. And, um, and I'm, I, I look forward to kind of hearing more from you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Did, did Chris join our meeting today? He did, Amy. I think he's on now. Yeah. Okay. Chris, do you have any comments? School committee comments. He was in his car, so I'm not sure what his signal is like. Yeah, I actually think he may have dropped off. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and myself as well, just thank you, um, Bala, for uh, participating in our meeting this uh, afternoon. We really appreciate it, and it certainly was very informative. Um, so with that, Susie, do we have a motion to adjourn? We do. Uh, move that the school committee adjourn its special meeting of September 25th, 2020. Second. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Um, since Judy is not with us, I will do the roll call vote myself. Yes. Susie? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Uh, Ms. Guida? Yes. Mr. Boudreaux? Yes. And Mr. Callanan? I'll try him. <laughs> Okay, I think he has dropped. Uh, so great, thank you so much uh, for everyone for um, participating in um, watching our school committee meeting this Friday afternoon. I hope you all have a great weekend and a great night. Good night. Thanks everybody, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you everybody.